Cool. Thank you, everyone, for um, coming this today. Um, what I'm going to talk you through, yes, is the Crest Registered um, Threat Intelligence Analysis course that we've created here at Crucial. But at the same time, rather than enjoy you 30 minutes of just talking for you purely like what's in the um, curriculum and how it's applicable, I'm going to combine it with a topic which is kind of one that's quite relevant now with cybersecurity, which is, again, is bridging this skills gap that we find um, in the industry as a whole. And I'm going to combine the both of them. So just to give you an overview then of the talk itself, I'm going to just introduce who I am because it does become applicable in regards to um, this skills gap and cyber threat intelligence and how it all fits together. I'll give you an overview of Crucial, what we do. We'll go into current market issues. We're going into one solution, possibly for cyber threat intelligence, marked with filling this gap. The process that could be used to kind of build capabilities within business, cyber threat intelligence as a whole, value of CTI, and then bridging that gap. Hopefully, at the end of the day, we're all building capability in this area. So who am I? Why do I get to stand here and talk about cyber threat intelligence? Um, really, it's to show you, it's a link with the rest of the kind of um, themes of this talk, is that six, seven years ago, myself, I was just in the Royal Marines. I hadn't really touched cybersecurity. I was, a, I was a techie geek at heart. I didn't really tell anyone. Um, but during my time there, you can see I specialize as a Royal Marine Mountain leader and reconnaissance troop. The reason I put that in is I specialize in intelligence. Um, I did it for my unit and company command, and actually a lot of the principles there that was learned in the military, especially like the intelligence cycle, defining requirements, has actually become very applicable when it comes to cyber threat intelligence. A lot of the principles there are borne out and are now placed in the cyber realm. From that point, really, I didn't have any pathway into cybersecurity itself. I was at the stage before cyber became a thing, and I made a lot of mistakes myself trying to get into the industry. And it's borne out for those mistakes as well that I've kind of brought them into Crucial Academy as how we now develop pathways. I'm going to focus on the military aspect because that's where I'm from, but it's applicable really for everyone. Um, from there, from really my self-teaching, I got picked up by Barclays Cyber Operations, and I worked there in their SOC, in their attack monitoring team defending the bank on a daily basis, 365 days, 24-7, from the threats. After learning my trade in there, I was picked up by Crucial Academy and asked to run, run the academy itself. From there, I've developed and took the skills from the military and then used it to build out a course, which is Cyber Threat Intelligence, which has now been registered by Crest. So to give you an idea, just again, background on Crucial and who you are, in case we haven't heard, and what I'm trying to do there at the academy. Uh, it's a government-backed private entity, and it was really, it was set up by former Royal Marines. No one really, apart from myself, had the background in cyber. But it goes to show that you don't necessarily need to have all that previous background to be able to be, um, to specialize in this area. Okay, hard work, dedication, and willing people normally get you the results that you require. What we then aim to do is deliver specialist courses in cybersecurity in order to strengthen the UK cybersecurity capability. What I'm trying to do is create a pathway which wasn't there when I was trying to go from the military into cybersecurity. And as a result, this year we were awarded the Cyber Skills Immediate Impact Fund from the government to help train veterans in cybersecurity itself. We're a little bit different from other kind of training companies, recruitment companies, however you want to kind of define it. We try and do a lot of things in one go. We aim to source people, and we source, we put a lot of effort into trying to find the right people to go into the right kind of jobs in cybersecurity. Once we find those right people, we then look to train them, provide them with the specialist courses and qualifications that they can add to their current really good skill set of resumes, and then we look to place them. We look to kind of place them into industry, into job roles with kind of the uh, relationships we've built over the last year and a half. And as a result, the concept works. So far, we've got a 98 pass rate on accredited exams. 84 of our students are now employed in cyber-selected roles. 70% of the CTI course that we ran 12 weeks ago are now already in cyber-related roles. Some of them who aren't in kind of roles at the minute are because in the military you have to do a year's worth of resettlement. And from there you can't necessarily leave early, depending on the requirements of what the military has. So then after that, during this year, we've looked to build partnerships across in industry and provide real-life training in what is delivered as well. So these guys and girls from the military can actually do the job, hopefully, before they actually jump into it. They can run a penetration test. They can run through a CTI kind of analysis kind of environment before jumping in. Yeah, just 
standard quote there. Right, so current market challenges. Why did then did I decide? Because Crest, Crest came to me and asked me to develop this course. Um, originally, I would just we looked to create a cyber offensive course, followed by a cyber defensive course and information assurance. Crest came to us and said, "Would you be willing to try and create a cyber registered threat intelligence analyst course?" Uh, and then, obviously, the reason why I'm here is because I took up that challenge and, and I created it. But there's current market statistics and challenges that we face still. Um, and these are ones that probably, again, you are all very familiar with as we've gone through the years. And if anything, they've only got worse. So at the minute, it's estimated that, again, you've got 350 unfilled cybersecurity positions by 2022 being forecast in Europe alone. That matches half a million that we find in America, and then the rest of it accounts up for the rest of the world. The UK currently has a vacancy rate of between 20 to 30 percent in regards to cybersecurity as a whole. And this is not new. We understand that there's a gap, hence why Crucial was born out to try and manage that, to try and ease up that de uh, mixture between de demand and supply. New talent has declined by 16.6% falling the number of students currently sitting computer related topic in the UK. And that's a fact, that's from a study in 2019, from the last year's GCSEs and A-levels. Um, it's an area that I'm very focused on and trying to develop again a pathway, not just from um, people in kind of post-education trying to get into cybersecurity. But I'm trying to also build out a pathway from the GCSEs up to the A-levels. If we can stream people in cybersecurity threat intelligence from the very beginning, the products that you're going to get by the time they come into industry is going to be fantastic. The Office of Budget Response Fee has estimated the UK will lose a staggering 50% of its EU national workforce after Brexit. That's no surprise. You all probably hopefully all work in the industry or you're looking for the industry while you're here now. And you've probably all seen people who you work with, because I had that while I was working in Barclays, who were worried about the Brexit effect and trying to hedge their bets on whether they stay in the UK or whether they go back, okay, back into Europe because of the effect of what Brexit and the uncertainty it's causing. And then revealed that the worldwide side skills gap, that just increases every year. So again, it's a problem that's not going away. We're not solving this issue. Every year, every year they come up with a new kind of statistic saying it's getting worse and worse. So why do we have a skills gap is a question that we can ask as well. And that's the only side I'm going to talk about Brexit, because again, with the current statistic we said before, it's going to have an effect, whether for good or bad, we don't know yet, okay? depending on how what comes out of the result of it. But we've got to be prepared for it, and we've got to try and plan for it. So some of the reasons then we have this skills gap and we're facing, it's not just in CTI, it's also in defensive cybersecurity, offensive cybersecurity, you name it, across the board we're finding those gaps. 92% of hiring managers admit they prioritize previous cyber security experience when choosing candidates. That's why with our course in the CRTI, I had a third week in there. We have two weeks of planning where for the first two weeks of the course, and I'll go into a lot more detail when I come on to the course very shortly, is really for them to develop the syllabus learning. Everything that's stated by Crest that they need to know to be able to go into industry is taught in those first two weeks. That third week, what I look to provide is an invite, and I'll show you some of the companies that I've asked to come down and who have come down, to try and provide real life support into industry. So at least when they go into the interviews, because once we hand them over to the interview process, it's really up to the candidate to be able to impress those hiring man managers at the end of the day. At least they'll be able to say that they've talked and spoken and they've actually done some of the stuff that they're expected to do when they walk into that job into those companies. A 2019 report found that 51% of IT pros in Europe have plans to find a new employer next year. We know that. A lot of people within this industry, because of the supply and demand issue, they get offers all the time coming in and saying, OK, you're doing this job, that's great. Why don't you come work for me for higher pay? And people will just move, and you probably experience it every six to 12 months. So we've got to go and try and invest in our people. Investing in training is one way that we can look to keep people in industry, because people in cybersecurity value technical skills. They want to progress. They want to get better. And having a good training platform where you can accredit them and having that pathway is one way of showing loyalty to your employers. Again, and this links in with what I just said, the top skills that are prioritized by hiring managers are communication skills and analytical. Yes, you want the full package for the person. But however, some workers prioritize their technical skills. They want to be able to go and get those qualifications. They want to be able to do that training to better themselves in their job role. There is currently, a, in my view, a disconnect between HR and the market. Depending on what, what HR have been told to maybe hire out there, maybe not necessarily what the market is producing. Or HR, for example, don't understand the cybersecurity market itself because, in a sense, it is, we're at the start of this journey understanding how cybersecurity fits in 
to the whole industry. They will be asking, for example, and you've probably all seen it on a lot of these job applications saying, we require someone who's done CISM, CISP, who is a CRT pen tester, who's also done defensive cybersecurity as well. There's no one out there who does that. That's because of there's a bit of a disconnect. And it's only through, again, a bit of education on both sides that we can like to bring that one together. <coughs> The shortage of workers in general due to underfunding, and this is across all areas, from education. Um, and I've seen that firsthand in regards to I was asked to go have a look at a private school syllabus recently from their GCSE and A-levels. I sat down in that room and they had um, two sheets of paper, one that was four pages long and one that was five pages long. I thought that was just snippets from their syllabus that they taught in computer science. That was the entire syllabus that they taught for cybersecurity. That was it, four and five pages throughout the whole of A-level and the whole of GCSE. So again, underfunding is not just monetary, but it's also in being able to build this capability from the very start. <laughs> and as we all know, there was, and there probably still is a little bit, it's one of the key questions I get asked all the time, how do I get into cyber threat intelligence? How do I get in to be a pen tester? There isn't these clear markers yet in regards to, if you do this, if you acquire these skills, and go for down this kind of route, yes, at the end of the day, you'll be able to become a pen tester. So that, again, is something that needs to be built out. So the bottom line is, cyber talent cannot simply produce, be produced fast enough to keep pace with demand. And that's, that's a very simplistic way to bring it out, but it's a good way to look at it. So moving into the crucial and the CRTIA. So at the start of this, nearly two years ago, it was just some Royal Marines um, sat together and said, we are going to try and change this, develop this into something new. So Royal Marines came together and we decided this, on this idea of an academy, which brings this kind of pathway together. And I'll rush through these because this is not the important bit. This is what, not what you're sitting here for. Um, but we looked at four key areas. Offensive, defensive, information assurance, and threat intelligence on what kind of what we thought the market was asking for. And we put together accredited courses, not courses that we thought the market wanted, but what was already out there that had a sign off so people knew the standard they were getting from the very start. And then Crest came asking, and they asked us to build a cyber threat intelligence analyst course. So the way we do it then is for us, it's not just about they come on the course, we give them two weeks of training, and then we just send them off hoping that they go get a job and they fend for themselves. This is the start of the pathway that I've started to incorporate for the rest of Crucial, is that once we pick them up from the application, they go through an online training, capability, uh, online training process where we can take these people and we can develop their skill sets even before they've come onto the training. So they can have a month, two months of learning in their own time the skill sets necessary. And the next slide will show you how I've tried to corporate that for CRTIA. From there, they go on to obviously the course that we have with us where we teach them the skills necessary to be able to pass. Because the pressure is on me to have built a curriculum that these people can come on and then pass the exam at the end of the day. And then afterwards, we provide them hopefully with the employment. We can't guarantee it, but we're there, someone fighting in their corner, hopefully to be able to <coughs> deliver them onto CRTA, uh, onto Cyber Threat Intelligence course and employment afterwards, followed by support. So the online training, you probably all heard of this company, Cybery. Cybery, um, I went to them and asked if they would like to do a partnership because that's what I used when I was learning cyber from seven years ago when it was very first there. Um, so we used the platform now and I built curriculum specific to cyber threat intelligence to hopefully when they come onto the course, they're not just learning from the very start these kind of concepts and processes. They've already done a lot of the virtual labs, a lot of the micro courses and courses to build them up so they're ready to go into the course, and it's not just learning, it's affirming what already they've learned. So Crucial Academy, this is how it looks at the minute. The reason why the one on the left is uh, uh, transparent is because that is the course that we're looking to develop next with Crest. But they're the others we offer, they're all accredited. This is why we're here, is the Threat Intelligence course. It's the Crest Registered Threat Intelligence Analyst Qualification. Here, I'll look to teach them again in just very big handfuls, cyber threat intelligence, tactical threat intelligence, investigations, open source intelligence, analysis and reporting. Um, so how did I do that? The way I went is I went out to market. I went out to industry. And I asked a lot of people who currently work out there, what are you kind of facing? What is cyber threat intelligence? Because there's so much I can, I can sit there and say what I think cyber threat intelligence is, but that's just my opinion. That's my worldview. 
the best thing if you want to build something that everyone wants to come in is you try and take everyone's opinion. So again, we all know cyber threat intelligence is, it looks to analyze information about the intent, capabilities, and opportunities of adversaries in cyberspace. So then I try to look at, again, what's, what's really the requirement? What are people asking for? And it was a lot of, a lot of businesses are asking, saying it's a growing requirement for their businesses. They realize that cyber threat intelligence can be a proactive defense against the threats that they're facing nowadays out there in industry. There's a more consumption of CTI, especially in the form of finalized intelligence making sure you get the right intelligence to the right people and you're communicating it correctly. And if you don't teach people about how to, again, you can have the best analysts in the world, but if they can't report it correctly, if they can't stand up their baby in a board and present their findings in a way that is not super technical so that everyone can understand, your intelligence gets lost in the mist. So you've got to be able to teach them the full range of skills. CTI market expected to grow. Again, more and more people are realizing the benefits of cyber threat intelligence. If you could put the controls in place before the threat even comes in, if you could see on the dark web that they're talking about certain attacks, you can learn about what kind of exploits are coming before they hit you, then you save yourself a hell of a lot of money because you're not then trying to react after you realize you've had a breach. You're already, you're just basically, you're monitoring and you're taking that note down and say, yep, they tried, they failed because we were ahead of the game. There's a growing number of threats. Again, going out to injury and saying, where are we now? Not, let's have a look where we were five years ago, because these attackers, they advance very quickly. So when I was working in the bank, again, when Apache struts hit, literally within hours, the exploits were coming out, trying to hit our systems, trying to exploit that framework exploit there. So they move incredibly quickly. And this is, again, we've got to be able to develop as well. There's no point doing a course like the cyber threat intelligence and just leaving it you've got to be able to update it continuously to the point where you're updating it even before, well, a couple of weeks before they come on the course. Because you want to be able to deliver them the best kind of understanding of what's out there. The classic one of that is only yesterday you, there was a report out about ransomware called Jokeroo, which is now we know ransomware as a service is, has been growing its maturity in the criminal networks. But now have to go to the people who, the students on the course and saying, right, this new form of ransomware basically is now, it is a business. They set it up, you can buy it as a service. Go on the dark web, they're advertising on Twitter, and people can go there now, depending on how much they want to spend, and they can have different subscription models for ransomware. So you've got to be able to incorporate the latest threats into the course so they can go out into industry and be effective. There's a growing attack surface, you need to be able to tell them that, yes, it's all great with the rise of the Internet of Things, it's great that everyone's now got mobile phones, tablets, but you've got to be understand it's not just computers now we're trying to be a protect against. Attackers are going to target everything now from your smartwatches to your tablets to your mobile phones um, to your home network as well. I'm making them understand that that was one of the big things, the growing demand for these analysts. So examples of threat intelligence action, if you're sitting here now thinking this is something that we need for our business or maybe this is something that could help us, these next few slides will show you where it's beneficial to have a CTI analyst in your business. So before an attack, you can automatically look to try and defend against these attacks. Like I mentioned before, if you can see where these criminal gangs are going, if you can bring in your intelligence feeds and start to then pick out the IOCs that are applicable to your business, then you can start to already change your defenses, maneuver yourself into a position where you're already kind of defend against them, rather than, again, like I said, you suffer a breach and then you're scrabbling around with your incident response, trying to then protect your business. You can integrate these tactical threat intelligence directly into your intrusion detection systems, firewalls, and seams. It links to the first point. And then you can block all these bad known IPs, URLs, and hashes. And the key point for this is if you get it right, if you get this bit right, okay, you, you're saving you money already. Can, we've all know GDPR has come in. You can't afford a lot of these businesses now to be reactive, to suffer a breach. Because 4% of your annual turnover, if you were to suffer the maximum that they could throw at you, is just not worth thinking about and trying to survive. During an attack, let's say they get past your first levels of defense and you actually, your monitor has picked up that they've already got through for some reason. Maybe it's a zero day, maybe they messed up halfway through, but during an attack, you can use threat intelligence to speed up the triage process. Okay, if you're quicker in the response and the cleanup, the less damage hopefully you will receive. This also allows security teams to prioritize more effectively the streaming of their workflow. If you understand maybe the threat actor that's already in your systems or who it is, because threat actor is not just your APTs, it could be your script kitty who just happens to get in. 
It could be, again, an insider threat. Whichever ones these are, it allows you, to, again, to act a lot more quickly than just trying to hope that you're in the right place. And then you go to operational intelligence, now threat hunting, which is a capability that has been around, but it's now that it's starting to mature a little bit as well. It allows your analysts to go into the system and find these people who are there hunting around your system who may have breached your first line of defense, who may be trying to break your second and third line of defense after you've incorporated, hopefully, a layered defense kind of network within your um, business. Examples of threat intelligence action then after attack. So let's say, unfortunately, yeah, they got all the way through, and sometimes they will. It's not a case that you're going to be able to protect against all of these. No one's 100% going to be on the defensive. There are going to be holes wherever, because it's going to be it's a shifting sand scenario. All your defenses, at some point, there will be a vulnerability, and you've got to be able to react quickly. But after attack, threat intelligence could provide the required detail for a forensics, investigations, reporting after attack. It's the lessons learned. It's understanding what happened and how so then next time you don't fall foul of it. So it allows you to perform certain cyber hygiene to prevent future attacks. If you know what ISCs are there that maybe you've missed, or you get a report after the attack from maybe a third party you've come in to have a look, you can properly clean up your system rather than maybe missing a back door. It can help contextualize the incident. Maybe you don't know what happened. Again, but a report after a threat attack reveals the full picture of who actually targeted you. So then you can, again, you put your resources where they need to for the next time. And then it helps with red team exercises. Practicing, practicing, practicing. Okay. You should always practice what you preach. Get your teams ready and drill them so when it does occur, again, it's slick. Everyone knows what they're doing, and the incident is cleared. So the value of CCI, I, mean, I think I've hopefully emphasized enough how important it is nowadays. But the value of CCI, just to hammer it home, is it improves visibility of threats and attack methodologies impacting our environments, which change on a daily, weekly basis. You just have to look at some of the threat attacks who've gone, Turla, for example, how they've, how they've gone from, again, using satellites for their command and control to now using, again, delving into scripting, updating their remote access Trojans to be more effective because they've realized the controls we've put in place. Okay, they see the controls. That doesn't work. How do we get past another certain control? And they adapt. Revealing vulnerabilities when new security measures should be implemented. Yep. More accurate risk analysis, risk underpins everything. So the whole of cybersecurity sits within risk management. It's not cybersecurity is separate from it. Whole of cybersecurity is there to try and mitigate and work with the risk management profile of a business. Reducing time to identify and respond to instances. I mentioned it already. Prioritization of efforts and resource utilization. And I'm just going to skip through these because you could read these because a lot of these are some of the points that I've already mentioned throughout. But I hope you can see there, threat intelligence now, just by investing in here, provides a huge benefit for businesses out there and reporting sensitive data and hopefully preventative. Yeah, so there's loads. There's loads there. And it's, that's, the list is, is endless. It's not, they're just a few of the ones that you can pick out and why it's good to start investing in this. The military have been doing it for years in regards to intelligence to be able to man their operations and see where to go next. And it's now just bringing those principles which you can from the military into a business to protect it. So the course. So th that's really how I went out to industry. I saw what it was about. I used material from the other courses that were very applicable to cyber threat intelligence, from our offensive, defensive, IA, because you need to really all combine all these courses together because there are some overlap, and saw what kind of what was out there. So this is kind of, in a very nutshell, this doesn't go, I'm not going to give you the whole syllabus because that would be boring. Okay, but some of the points is you need to have an introduction to cyber threat intelligence if you're starting out from the beginning. From there, you need to understand what intelligence is. You need to understand how it fits from bringing in your data sources, information sources, and turning that information. You, ask, you need to be able to ask the right questions of that information, which then turns it into intelligence, which is something that you can use effectively for your business. You then need to understand the process, again, from that data intelligence and how it then moves into the intelligence cycle. How your IOCs, just because you stick them in once, doesn't mean that then you can keep them there. There's a maturity level to into the, um, your IOCs. Okay? And once they become ineffective and they don't pick up those attack vectors anymore, they need to be removed from the system. That means it keeps you current. How then you use threat intelligence within the business? It's not going to be a be all center, just by saying you have a CTI analyst in there, or you have a CTI team, does not mean it's effective. It needs to then be used, along with implementing an intelligent program, 
with all the factions within that business. It can be a very personal thing in regards to business. You can't just have one in that producing all these reports and send them out via email, but if no one reads those reports and you don't implement it with the rest of the business, that intelligence is useless. You need to get the whole cycle in where you can bring in the information, ask the right questions, and then disseminate to the right people, and then they action it appropriately to be effective. You need to understand about the Dimer model and cyber kill chain. There are frameworks that are used to be able to go through, um, for example, if you have an intrusion. How to make sure you pick up all the right um, IOCs, incidents, or compromise. Um, sorry if I've been using that without saying. But then, for example, if you understand that you have a framework to use where you have an intrusion, and you can work your way through the cyber kill chain, all those different steps, because it might be, for example, you find out someone's in your system, but you don't know how they got there. So you can use certain frameworks to work your way back to then determine, OK, it came from an email sent on this date to this person. Cool, we've got that information. Let's see who else it got sent to. Because then you may find it wasn't just one incident where you found it's been breached. It's actually five or six within your business. Or maybe everyone got it and you just missed it. And that's where understanding how having a framework can work to make sure you pick up all the kind of compromises and breaches that business may find. You then can go through the open source intelligence techniques, and that's just picking out, using stuff that's freely available that everyone here can go on to now, but understanding where the resources and tools are, incorporating different tools together to be able to get a full picture as well, understanding how to use Shodan, understanding how to use um, all the different kind of maps that are out there, not just Google Maps, but combining the data together to build out a bigger picture of what you're kind of facing. Advanced data collection is something that I brought back from industry, which from Digital Shadows, which will be my next slide. Just seeing, again, how industry is doing it, how they are bringing in this intelligence and making it work. And then we go through quite a lot of case studies. Ones that are very famous, such as the Sony breach, to ones that are not so, maybe have only been um, produced by certain people. Hence, an anonymous study that we also go through a case study. So real world insights, we're nearly finished. Um, this is the week three. So this is what we offer. Um, we have a really good relationship with Digital Shadows, um, where they come down and they produce and say, look, you've done the CRTIA, you've got the qualification. This is how it's now applied in real life. So then when they go to their interviews, they can say, they can talk about what it's like to work in a CTI environment as well. So hopefully it gives them a bit more kudos when they sit in that interview process. That's where teams at the minute and businesses are pulling their CTI skill sets at the minute. And that's from a SANS report from 2019. They're pulling people out of the SOX, instant response teams, dedicated CTI teams. That's great, but you're removing them from those processes already within the business. And what I'm saying is, what about these people? Instant response, that's your CTI team there, that's your security operations center, and that's your networking. These are people from the military who have been doing this. Maybe they're not in the capacity they realize, but makes them really interesting and really good fits to moving into CTI. And I'm gonna just bring these up because I know I'm about 28 minutes in and they're looking at me saying finish. But these people, again, if you look through the doctrine of CTI, if you've studied it, a lot of the concepts are born out of CIA in regards to how they interpret intelligence, okay? Sherman Kent, one of the founders of intelligence in CTI, Okay, you sign a lot of his stuff comes in now to CTI. The intelligence cycle is very, very military. It fits into CTI and is bought into there as well. So this is why there's such a good fit in regards to moving from a career in the military into a CTI analyst kind of role. Just a case study we had. 14 years military career. Digital forensic analyst with UK military. Came to Crucial. He now sits in the IBM, IBM Cyber Threat Intelligence Analyst. And from what we've seen so far, and the reports with feedback we've got, is doing really, really well. So last two slides. Okay. Skill sets need to match pace technology requirements. This stuff moves so quickly that you can imagine that if you don't keep pace and keep updating your team, they'll be out of date so quickly. So keeping up to date with this is vital. Investment in early GCSE and A-level education, yes, that's more of a national kind of thing. That's kind of what, that's one of my passions and what I would like to try and achieve. Accepting the need to invest in development of training because more talents need to stem the high levels of job movement. People are gonna move at the minute. Until we get that kind of level of demand supply, people are gonna move. And if you don't want them to move, you've got to invest in them. And the best way to do it is training because that's what they want. You saw the skill sets, they value technical skills rather than the, kind of the analytical and the communication. Better communication the employee requirements, again, to the HR, bringing that kind of dis dissatisfaction between and closing that gap. 
make cyber careers more open and desirable. There was um, a report saying that people, in regards to why there was only 16% drop in people taking up, it's because one of the reasons that people see the hacker kind of mentality working in cybersecurity, being a hacker in a hoodie working on your own, was all what the young children saw what it was like to work in cybersecurity. So there is a kind of, uh, in some sense, that used to be cool, now it's no longer. So it's kind of opening up what it is like to work in cybersecurity, those pathways it can be. More cyber apprenticeships. Awareness that AI and machine learning will only solve the issue so far. You're still going to need people at the end of the day. Maybe you can automate a few people's jobs into one, but you're going to still need people. They won't solve the whole thing. And tap into groups such as women, military, numerous, diverse, et cetera. For my final slide, I promise, that is it. Um, my recommendation is look to partnerships. We can't solve this on our own. Okay, it's better at the minute to work together than to strive alone, because at the end of the day, behind every attack is a human adversary. Humans adapt and change their TTPs in response to the security controls we put in place. And then effective defense requires dedicated, capable, and adaptable professionals. Thank you very much.